answer for a five-year-old son who is asking in agonizing pathos emotion. Daddy, why do white people treat color people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, etc., etc. So a lot of sort of very specific emotional pleas of discrimination. This is what discrimination is. He talks about complacency. Uh, one, is, one is a force of complacency made up of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation. And a few Negroes in the middle class who, because of their degree of academic and economic security, and at points they profit from segregation, have unconsciously become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is, as we close, those are the complacent folks. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred and comes uh, per perilously, perilously close to advocating violence. This is, he talks sort of about Malcolm X. Um, so he's talking about how, again, setting up why the nonviolent is the, the good way to go. Um, talks about more injustices. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I've watched white churches stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious revelances and sanctimonious trivialities in the midst of a midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I've heard so many ministers say, those are the social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which made a strange distinction between body and soul, the sacred and the secular. He's taking them to town. And then he ends. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope the circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark, dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all of their scintillating beauty. And some good words. <laughs> that good. Um, it really is uh, pretty uh, amazing. So hopefully you've had the chance to, to read it. Um, and what are the thoughts, lessons, takeaways? Um, I'll let you... Consider that I'm not going to tell you the answers here or if there is any right answers. Um, but all of this sort of boils down to this class is sort of like the letter from Birmingham Jail. It's all about teaching you nonviolent modes of advocacy. Even though, and social disobedience might be that, though it's nonviolence. Um, though, again, I am not lecturing you to go to jail. Please don't go to jail. Please don't get arrested. Uh, but also the idea, so I'm, I want you to teach you strategies, but also understand that these strategies are, are works of rhetoric and they work rhetorically. Okay. So, two big sort of ideas to think about just from a theory point of view. Rhetorical well, techne and praxis. Techne is sort of the art or technique, um, the skills that we learn and also allow us to analyze or interpret um, rhetorical texts such as a letter. Praxis is that sort of process of, of creating the way we see the world uh, through our rhetorical sort of actions. Um, so these blur together, but you know we're sort of learning the theory and process, theory and practice, if you want to put it that way, and how they sort of relate to one another. So as a technique, right? As a um, the letter does some really interesting things. If you're familiar with the uh, the traditional canons of rhetoric from uh, Aristotle, you know it's basically. You know, we can sort of see what's going on in this letter. When you're reading it, think about the organization. How is it organized strategically? How does he start? Uh, 
if it, you know, what, what does he do next? And how does he sort of build to the end? And what does he do in the conclusion? Um, what invention, as a, um, as a rhetorical term, rhetorical uh, canon, sort of means inventing or coming up with your main uh, ideas or messages. Um, some people call it arguments, but he talks about uh, issues of morality um, and, and he's building up his own credibility throughout this process. Um, there's a lot of examples of, of discrimination. There's a lot of emotional uh, examples of discrimination. Um, style, uh, which oftentimes means metaphor. Uh, or other figures of speech. Obviously that last section there. Uh, Burke calls, um, well says the metaphor oftentimes works as a terministic uh, screen, giving us a terministic compulsion. That is, we start seeing the world that way instead of this way over here. We are compelled to see the world a particular way. And so, yeah, uh, when he talks about how uh, dark clouds of racial prejudice, I mean, that gives you a certain way of, of, of looking at at things um, and compels us to you know, perhaps want to get rid of those dark clouds so you know we can see the sun uh, and the stars um, and then so yeah, so pretty much the other canon organization I mentioned style delivery letter usually delivery traditionally meant uh, nonverbal stuff when you're actually like giving a speech and then memory was the other one, but we had forgotten that. This obviously was written, it wasn't memorized, but that might matter in a certain situation. So we see, we can look at this as a technique and sort of think about what he's doing strategically to try to uh, influence others. But also what he's saying is itself a process of practice. Um, he talks about and teaches us about uh, the importance of nonviolent protest um, and sort of, you know, makes an argument and makes a case for that, uh, but sort of frames nonviolent protest as the way and perhaps the only way to uh, make a difference, to, to make social process, make social change. He talks about this four step process um, collection of information, research the problem, find the facts. Negotiate, then self purifications. Where are you really? Do you have the courage and understand how what's going to happen? And then that direct action. Another idea of complacency doesn't work. He teaches us that and sort of frames complacency in a particular way. Uh, he also uh, frames violence as a, as a particular way. And so he offers us this sort of image, this sort of uh, culture. Of always fighting oppression uh, in all its various guises because as we learn justice anywhere a threat to justice anywhere well I should remember that a threat to where's the context stuff oh yeah I want to make sure I'm getting this right there it is Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I gotta memorize that. It is memorized, but then I didn't memorize it. So it wasn't memorized. Memorize that. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's one of the big lessons here. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So far as, hold on, there he is. 7089. That's an important number. So this is sort of a, I mean, it's a brilliant letter, uh, and uh, it gives us a sense of, of the part. I'm using this to sort of explain what this class, in, from my mind, is, is really all about, um, and how it might be a little bit different than some of the other classes that you have taken. Um, hopefully, hopefully you read this letter. Uh, listen to me blah and uh, and think and reflect on you know this is rhetorical technique and rhetorical praxis and I'll be back uh, tomorrow at some point to uh, to say more about this lovely book here even though I know a lot of you probably will be trying to get this book 
uh, tomorrow. I might not have the opportunity to read the chapters I'm asking you to read before you actually watch my stuff, but nonetheless, that's how I'll have to handle things for the first couple of days until you get your books and they, until they come from Canada. <laughs> Take off, eh? Okay, have a great evening.